What I have for you this morning is a reflection on a wonderful movie. It was The Beasts of the Southern Wild, came out in 2012, and had a, a, a marvelous way of getting at the issues that we're honoring this morning. So we start at Hush Puppy's house. Hush Puppy is our protagonist. The house is a trailer. It's up on some um, oil barrels, so it's uh, up away from the frequent flooding that um, uh, comes their way. Um, we, the bathtub is the name of the town. It's a place beyond the levee that is a little beyond the reach of industrialized civilization. It's a little town with a, a downtown of sorts and streets and cars and everything, but frequent flooding. They're not afraid of a little water, they like to say among themselves. Our protagonist is six years old, and she's going to navigate a world of chaos. She can hear heartbeats. She holds up a little creature and hears the heartbeat. She's even near her pets and hears the heartbeat. If she's near her father, she hears heartbeats. This is the heartbeat of Earth. And she says all the time, everywhere, everything's organs be beaten and squirting and talking to each other in ways I can't understand. Most of the time, they're probably just saying, I'm hungry, but sometimes they're talking in codes. Daddy, known as Wink to his friends, is thoughtful, a bit rough around the edges. He says his feet up time, and so uh, he gets around uh, gathering up some food for, for Hush Puppy and himself and, and the animals that they raise and, and her pets. Near their place is the levee. This divides the world from the wetter place outside. That's, that's Wink's little boat. It's actually an old truck bed on some um, barrels that he keeps inflated so they can navigate around. And you see all the industrialization on the higher ground, only slightly higher, but thanks to the levee, they don't get flooded over there, but thanks to the levee, the bathtub gets flooded extra. But the bathtub is a happy place. Wink says, ain't that ugly over there? We live in the prettiest place on earth. Hush Puppy says, Daddy says, up above the levee on the dry side, they're afraid of water, like a bunch of babies. They built that wall that cuts us off. They think we're going to drown out here, but we ain't going nowhere. She says, the bathtub has more holidays than the whole rest of the world. There's musicians all the time. There's a, there's a parade, all the cars coming down the street. And the signs say, welcome to the bathtub storm season. Daddy always saying that up in the dry world, they got none of what we got here. They only got holidays once a year. Fireworks, there's fireworks. They got fish stuck in plastic wrappers. They got their babies stuck in carriages and chickens on sticks and all that kind of stuff. One day, the storm's going to blow. The ground's going to sink and the water's going to rise up so high, there ain't going to be no bathtub. Just a whole bunch of water. But me and my daddy, we stay right here. We who the earth is for. Then we see Hush Puppy with the fireworks. She is part of the party. She is part of the bathtub. She is part of the world. There's a bar. It's called Lady Joe's. Um, they spend a lot of time in the bar and eating fish and having good times and drinking a bunch. There's a school. The school in session is inside a kind of floating room, and there's only a few kids. It's a one-room schoolhouse. It's not even a house. It's a barge. Anyway, there's a good teacher. She shows her leg where her tattoos are her blackboard. Her tattoos show the aurochs, the aurochs that were around in the primeval times, the aurochs who are frozen in the in the ice caps that will someday melt. Daddy is missing, and, and, and Hush Puppy doesn't know why, and then he shows up. He shows up in a hospital gown, but he doesn't explain. Why is Daddy in a dress? Why are you, why are you wearing a bracelet? Well, you know, it's a little hospital bracelet. And um, she uh, is very dependent on Daddy, and he doesn't explain himself very well. And here he is in a hospital gown. She doesn't know why. Well, we gradually piece together that that hospital gown is about, about his heart condition. 
and he still got it on because he didn't stay in the hospital like he was supposed to, but he's not much one for listening. Michael, I don't think we have the hospital gown slide up. It's the next one. Hmm. Well, maybe my things are out of order. Maybe, maybe I'm in the wrong. It has, it, such things have happened. You're right. Okay, my pages are out of order. I'll get to the hospital again in a moment. A little more back up to the to the uh, cave painting, which, which is actually Miss Bash, Bathshe. What a great name for people who live in the bathtub. Miss Bathsheba is the teacher. She goes on about the aura. Back one more. My problem. A fierce, mean creature that roamed the earth back when we all lived in caves. They would gobble up cave babies right down in front of their cave parents, and the cave men couldn't do anything about it because they were too poor, too stupid, too small. That's Hush Puppy narrating. And now we'll have the map, bathtub. The map is, is, is what Miss Bathsheba explains. Everything south of that levee is just going to be water someday. Y'all better think about that, she says. Because any day now, the fabric of the universe is coming unraveled. The ice cap's going to melt. Water's going to rise, and everything south of the levee's going under. And we see the ice cap melting. This is hush puppy slipping into fantasy. This, this lecture is not just the tattoos and the, the caves from Lascaux. The, the paintings of those ancient creatures. It's the whole scary story. And it, it's not clear in the movie whether these are dreams or little daydreams or visions or something, but things are happening. Way back in the day, the aurochs was king of the world. If it wasn't for giant snowballs and the iced age, I wouldn't even be hush puppy. I would just be breakfast. We see the frozen auroch. This is the auroch still in the ice, but the ice is starting to melt. And finally, we get to Daddy's house. I'm going to catch up with myself. This is when she goes to look for Daddy. It's feed up time, but Daddy's not around. She makes a drawing of Daddy in her bed and snuggles up with that instead. And that is her kind of cave painting. It looks a little like cave painting when you see that next slide with Michael. This is the one where, I think it's the next one. This is the one that looks like a cave painting. Well, I'm all kind of, no, backing up, backing up. This is the one, thank you. Um, and then she can, she can do her own cave painting and create her daddy when he's away. And then he comes back in the dress, and I've talked about that a little bit. There's more cave paintings. There's, there's two more, Michael. It's past the uh, hospital gown, the next one over. That's her cave painting of herself. She has cardboard around. If daddy kill me, I ain't going to be forgotten. I'm recording my story for the scientists of the future. In a million years, when kids go to school, they're going to know that once there was a hush puppy and she lived with her daddy in the bathtub. She's, daddy gets kind of gruff. He's very loving, really, but, but he's trying to keep order on her shoestring. And, and, and so she's a little bit scared of him, and, and she's also terribly loving. Um, she gets upset. While he's away, she tried to cook something, and when he comes back, she realizes the, the, the fire is still on and goes back, but the whole house catches on fire. And she, she grabs that, that shirt. You saw it for a moment there. That's Mama's shirt. She's got a little drawing of Mama on the wall that she talks to at great length. Now she's got the shirt, and um, things are not going well. Things are not going well for the bathtub and things are not going well for Hush Puppy and Daddy. Okay, change that slide, and I'll try to figure out where I am and keep going. Oh, yeah, this is the one where the boy is ringing that the storm is coming. They were expecting this. They were expecting this. Um, this is storm season, and Miss Bathsheba, she's been talking about how the storms are getting bigger and bigger, and we are going to have to deal with the rising waters. She doesn't think once the waters rise, they'll ever go down again. And, and the winds start howling, and they mobilize to get away. There's an evacuation. And the next slide shows cars leaving town as Daddy comes back yet again. He keeps coming and going. It has to do with his heart condition. And sometimes he just lies down and is out of order. That is, kind of slips off into sleep or something. Daddy returns. And we go back to, to Lady Joe's bar, and, and the crowd starts talking about the storm, and some of them are going to leave, and some of them aren't, and there's a good deal of, of criticism all around. Look at all those people running around all over the damn place. Say, uh, say la vie, y'all. 
I mean, we are in Cajun country, but I don't speak much French. I, I can say, uh, les ailes les bons temps roulés. That's, that's, that's about my French. That's a, let the good times roll for those of you who are as ignorant as I am. Now, Wink in the bar there says, I know y'all with me, and y'all doing the storm. Doing the storms means staying, it, staying, fighting it, putting up with it. And, uh, and uh, the proprietor of the bar says, Lady Joe's ain't never closed, honey. That's what I'm talking about, Daddy says. Walmart's my big man. You staying? Wrong number, buddy. I'm out of here as soon as I finish my beer. Wink, that's Daddy, dismisses him with a wave of his hand. You ain't going nowhere. And Walworth, the friend, says, this ain't no sneeze coming out the gulf. I'm gone, brother. And Wink, ignoring him, says, I'll see you tomorrow, Walworth. But the, uh, the, the aurochs are stirring. And Hush Peppy keeps seeing these visions like they're out of the ice now, like they're running. And we don't know what that's all about. Clearly, it's a metaphor for the danger and a metaphor for Hush Puppy's own fears. It is the upcoming situation that we will have to face both emotionally and practically. So we get back to Wink's house. Um, and he, he uh, knows the storm is coming and he has, he has uh, Hush Puppy get in a trunk which will float and he's on, a, on an air mattress. So they're gonna go to sleep. But when the water comes, we'll just float up and climb out through the ceiling. It actually works, and they climb out on the roof. Uh, but the house is mostly underwater, and that house is up on at least 15 feet of posts. So the water is all the way up to 15 feet plus, and then it looks like another six or so. They get out in the boat, called the truck, to see the damage, and all the neighbor's houses are smashed up, and they call out for them, but they're gone. They're gone. They go back to the bar. And, and people are trying to cope with it. Well, the first thing they see is, now that bar is about 20 feet up off the earth and <laughs> Walrus steps out the door and falls right in the water. There is no step there, it's just water. And he says, oh, it must have passed out. Well, he's drunk most of the time, so that wouldn't be too big a surprise. Um, here it is, the, the storm has come. And it was pretty scary. All night long, they were terrified of the thunder and all, but they're still there. They have survived so far, but most of everything they know is underwater. It's going to keep coming up. The question is whether they can stay. The teacher there, stay on the teacher there, Michael. The, the teacher says um, that water is not going back down. We, we're going to have to go. We're going to have to get out. Uh, you're going to have to face this. And Wink says, oh, no, I, I got this under control. And that's the attitude we have to watch out for that there's nothing much we have to do, maybe you know, blow up an air mattress or something. So we have the two voices, the slightly more educated person here, the teacher. She knows that things are really going to be bad. Here's her voice. Man, you know they got plenty of salt coming in that, into that water. Everything beautiful is gone. Trees are gonna die first, then the animals, then the fish. And Wink says, I got it all under control. Well, he's never seen what she's talking about. She's read a book or two. He's been able to fish and bring up a lot of fish and feed everybody. Uh, the, the, the trees and the animals have always been there. So what do we have here? This rich film um, has all kinds of archetypal patterns in it. We've got a, a, a strong character who um, is on an initiatory journey even at her very young age. And the point of having a very young character in a story is to remind us of our vulnerability in the face of big lessons. When things are, are more than we are used to handling, we feel young again. Um, we've got this community. We have a, a collective that cares about each other. We've got a beloved community, this little town, uh, not much supported by the mainstream, and yet they get along or have in the past. And then these aurochs, these beasts, the primordial forces, the forces of nature that will be dealt with one way or another. Hush Puppy's arc is what we are following. She goes through a process of moving from innocence to a deeper understanding of herself and her place in the world. The journey is marked by her confrontation with the aurochs and her acceptance of her father's mortality. Water is a symbol for mystery. Water is, is, is also very, very destructive. Uh, it's, it's a good thing when you need it. It's not a good thing when it has salt in it and you grow things. So we have 
this overwhelming flood, like the flood in the um, in the Bible. Actually, um, the, the, that one I want with the building on the on, on the on the yellow uh, schoolhouse there, Michael. That's the one where they're going to rebuild the schoolhouse. It's one of the most uh, intact structures because it was always a floating barge. They're going to make an ark out of it, just like in the Bible. And they've got various boats and, and, and barges and things. They're going to tie it so that the whole village is going to be a floating regatta of a very shabby nature. And that is their, that is their uh, survival technique. Well, okay, there's some sense in that. Um, if the water comes, float, deal with it. Whether that can work, we is going to build a camp right on top of the bathtub. We got enough animals to eat until the water goes down. And Myth Bathsheba says, this is the most important thing I can ever teach y'all. You got to take care of people that's smaller and sweeter than you are. She's very good with the kids, especially the younger ones. But those aurochs are on the move. Wink has a plan. One more, Michael. That's the plan. That's, um, that's uh, the carcass of an alligator or, 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 or gar, which is another kind of variation, but I'm not sure what kind of fish. It's something big. And they have eaten it already, but they've got the carcass, and they load it up with butane tanks and um, gallon bottles of gasoline and then put some dynamite in its ma mouth. What, what are we going to do here? Bathsheba, the teacher, thinks... You're not going to go for that levee. If you even touch that levee, all they'll do is come here and, and, and take us away. They'll take us to some kind of shelter. They don't even know we're here right now. Let's leave it that way. But Wink's got it under control. He's got this kind of violent reaction, which is pretty much understandable. Hush Puppy comments, the entire universe depends on everything fitting together just right. If you can fix the broken piece, it can all go back right. This is Wink's idea of fixing the broken place. It does not go well, the teacher was right. Oh, the levee breaks and the water goes down. And Hush Puppy comments, it didn't matter that the water was gone. Sometimes you can break something so bad that it can't be put back together. The helicopters arrive. This is a mandatory evacuation area. You can no longer live here. Everyone in this area has to leave. I repeat, and it's flying around, knowing people are hiding in that wreckage. And then the troops show up, and soon, sooner than later, we're in a um, uh, shelter. Sorry, I couldn't find the word. Senior moment. We're in a shelter. That's what the world looks like after the water is gone. That's what the shelter looks like. It's on high ground, and it's cold. And when Hush Puppy goes in, she says it, it, it doesn't really look like a prison. Daddy said it would be a prison. It looks more like a fish tank with no water. Everybody kind of flopping about. And the doctor talks to Daddy about the operation he needs, and Daddy won't hear it. We understand that, that Daddy took a run from the hospital before in the story. That's his reaction to uh, health crises, is not to get an operation, but just to be sure he has it all under control. Hush Puppy says, when an animal gets sick here, they plug it into the wall. Daddy says, if he ever got so old he couldn't drink beer or catch catfish, that I had to put him in a boat and set him on fire so no one could come plug him into the wall. She gets um, cared for in this shelter. There's a babysitter who tries to teach her some manners and gets her all dressed. Uh, well, not in the way she's used to getting dressed for school, um, but um, kind of cute. She doesn't like it much. Daddy's a bit horrified. So what do they do? Prison break. They run for it. They take off. They try to go back. Well, Wink can barely walk, and he's not long for this world. They get home, and the friends set Wink down. <sighs> Hush Puppy says everybody loses the thing that made them. It's even how it's supposed to be in nature. Then Hush Puppy gets an idea. She goes looking for her mama. Now, the only presence of the mama we've heard is just a few memories and a little conversation with her shirt, which was up against the wall with some lights around it at one point. She has an idea. She might be working at the floating catfish house. There is 
uh, story that uh, Wink keeps telling about what an incredible cook she was. She, she was so hot, if she walked by the range, it would turn itself on, and the water would just start boiling. I mean, these magical stories. So somehow, this is the only restaurant anywhere near. It's a floating kind of barge place. Mostly oil workers will go there. And um, so uh, a few, with a few of her little friends who have made the, the breakout from the shelter, Hush Puppy actually manages to get there. And she actually go, she goes into the, she's going to be the cook, right? That's who Mama is, this incredible cook. Well, she finds the cook. It's never clear in the story if this is Mama. The cook's very happy to see her, a little baby, you want something? She's cute as hell. And the, the cook takes to her and makes her some food. Uh, it's uh, alligator, a uh, deep fried uh, alligator tail, which is quite a delicacy. And she has something to eat with a few grits and such. And she wants the cook, who she calls mama, to come home and take care of daddy and her. She says, well, I don't, I don't know anything about this daddy, but I, I can't take anybody care of anybody but myself. You could stay if you wanted. She likes Hush Puppy. She would take care of Hush Puppy. But you see, Hush Puppy has to take care of daddy. Remember? all that. Well, the cook gives her a little lesson of sorts before she goes. Let me tell you something, child. When you're a child, people tell you that everything's going to be all hunky-dory and all that, but I'm here to tell you that it's not. So get that right out of your head right now. Life's some big old feast? Yeah. But you, you ain't nothing but a stupid little waitress Everything you got on your platter going to fall on the floor and ain't nobody going to be there to pick it up for you. Someday it's all going to be on you. Kind of tough lesson. She's getting them from all sides, but she's in a tough situation. And she says she's got to go. And she gathers up a little friends and they take off and they walk through that wasteland. It's a pretty uh, rough place. They, they see some aurochs in the water. The aurochs are in the movie. You can actually see them out in the air now that where they just fantasy. Now they seem to be right here with us. That's the nature of creeping danger. And Hush Puppy comments, they the type of animals that eats their own mamas and daddy. There's a rumble. Finally, she gets near home. This is the remaining of the shack that is left of daddy's house. She's within sight of that little shack. And the Oroch catches up with her. And there's a little bit of a bridge. And she's moving along. Her, kid, her friends have run for it. But the big Oroch gets right behind her, and she isn't running like her friends. Next slide, Michael. She turns and faces it, and the auroch stops. The auroch was running after these kids and stops, it looks at her, and there's a close-up of the eye. I didn't get a, a slide of that, but they look right at each other, and then the auroch kneels, and then the other aurochs kneel. Then very quietly, they get up and walk away slowly. This is the climactic moment of the story. This is little six-year-old hush puppy facing her own fears and facing the situation. It is not the resolution of the situation, but emotionally it is the beginning. If she takes it on, maybe she can do something. Daddy, looking through the what was the wall, not even a window, but he can see it. Daddy looks over and sees all of this, and it's pretty impressive. And he's not. He's pretty sick. He's not long for this world. And she goes in. She's got a little carry-out box from the Elysian Fields. Isn't that a great name for a shabby old cafe on the water? But uh, it, it, it's paradise to Hush Puppy. And she has brought home manna. This is some little fried gator. Uh, and she dips it in the hot sauce and gives a small bite to her daddy, who can barely eat it. And he's taken a long time with it. And she has a bite herself. And she's, she goes very slow so that they end the one small bite together. And he's able to say, really good. But you can, home, you can hardly hear him. And uh, she goes over toward him, and they, they snuggle, and she can hear his heartbeat. She's always able to hear the heartbeat. And she can hear this one in her daddy until it stops. Yeah, we knew that was coming. It's still hard. And all his friends get that burial together he had described to her on, on the truck, some wood, and, and, uh, and they give him a Viking burial. They, they push it out there flaming and watch it sink. And that is how he wanted to go. And that's the end of Daddy, but not the end of the story. The story goes on with Hush Puppy. And um, so there it is. Um, 
they have to leave. The, 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 the remainder is sinking fast. The, the, the water is, is rising again, just like the teacher said. So yeah, they said they were not going to leave, but that energy's dead now with daddy. And we see the road is going to, even, even the entry road is going to be swallowed by the water. And that's the end of the story. When I die, the scientists of the future, they're going to find it all. They're going to know once there was a hush puppy and she lived with her daddy in the bathtub. Climate change hits the poor first. The movie is fiction, but these things are happening all over the world. The waters are rising. The aurochs are on the move. Her resilience uh, resembles the potentialities of our own human spirit. In the face of adversity, we can find strength within ourselves. The toxic inequality is, is saddening. We, we, we see that these folks on, on, the, on the bad side of the levee, now that levee was built to protect those oil plants and all, to protect the middle class, to protect the people with something, us. You know, we're, we're on the safe side of the levee, but the water's going to rise. The levee's only so high. That's only going to last for a little while. All the people outside of it are going to have to scramble for it, try to climb over the levee somehow. We need to reimagine our relationship with the earth because the aurochs and our collective fate are the forces beyond our control at the moment. Just as Hush Puppy faces them head on, we must confront our collective fate, like Hush Puppy, who says, we is who the earth is for. May we honor our interconnectedness, embrace courage, weave new myths. For in the unraveling, we discover our shared humanity and the wild beauty of our fragile world. So um, action steps, uh, we know what to do. We are, we are the people that organize. We know, first of all, to have storytelling. Why do we, why am I getting there by way of a story? To say the obvious here, because you feel something in a story. And the problem with big challenges, we turn down the emotion. We need to turn up the emotion. We need to feel it more. Then we need to balance emotion and action. Because it, it, it won't help to get overwhelmed by the sadness and not, and not work. We need to be uh, scared. We need to be sad. And we need to be organizing have um, local initiatives that already exist and, and do what we can to support them, do what we can to be prepared, do what we can to lobby for policy change and corporate accountability, uh, promote climate education, promote skill building, form partnerships, alliances for global solidarity so that we can move forward. We make right the wrongs of the past, not by ignoring them, but by doing the difficult work of dismantling. Reimagining together, we build new relationships. Let us put love at the center of client justice, climate justice work. Namaste. Blessed be. And so on.